announcements, though, in this, though in this virtual format, they won't include a request for you to silence your phones or where the restrooms are located. For starters, thank you to each member of this year's event committee for supporting this virtual breakfast and JNF. Because of the large number of committee members, I'm not going to read off their names. You saw them in the scrolling announcements before the program actually began and in the promotional materials for today. But we are very grateful for their efforts in making today a success. We must also thank the Temple's board and officers led by President Don Solomon and the Temple staff, especially Janice Hadesman and Leslie Haynes, for their many hours of work preparing for this morning. Thank you also to JNF staff for all of its help and guidance. We also want to recognize Jill Weininger and Ellen Hattenbeck, long-standing and active members of our congregation who occupy leadership positions in JNF. Ladies, for that and other reasons, we are proud of you. Of course, we are grateful to Rabbi Lipman for being with us today. We are eager to hear his comments. And as always, we appreciate the inspiration, time, and value contributed to today's program and the temple by our own clergy, Rabbi Helbron, Rabbi Weisberg, Rabbi Mafik and Cantor Kahan. And as they say, last but certainly not least, there are a couple of other people in attendance today who we want to recognize for their support of Israel and for all the leadership they provide and the good work they do. State Representative Jonathan Carroll and his wife Katrina and US Congressman Brad Schneider and his wife Julie. Brad, we are very happy to hear that you are on the road to Rafu recovery and wish you a Rafu Shlema. Thank you all again for joining us today and supporting the great work of JNF. Hopefully we will all be able to be together in person for our 13th annual breakfast for JNF. And now I turn the microphone over to Rabbi Helbron. Um, good morning. Um, it's wonderful to have all of you here with us. Uh, we are excited to have Rabbi, Rabbi Lippman joining us uh, this year. And um, I just, I couldn't uh, let the moment pass without uh, sharing a Devar Torah with you. A little word of Torah to kick off this morning. I just wanted to turn back to last week's portion, which we read yesterday, uh, and um, which talks to us about this momentous occasion, uh, perhaps the most important uh, moment in Jewish history when God appears to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai and we receive the Ten Commandments. And I think it's interesting uh, to realize that this Torah portion where we are receiving the Ten Commandments is called by the name of Yitro. Now, what is Yitro? Yitro happens to be Moses's Midianite father-in-law. It's a little odd, right? We're getting the Torah at Mount Sinai, this, this event, this moment that binds us to God as a people. And the portion is named after his wife's father. Why, why is that? And, and I think we can see, we can understand why that happens um, from the very beginning moment when he is introduced to us. He's introduced to us um, as uh, coming to greet Moses. He's heard about all of the incredible work that Moses has been doing, and he comes to greet Moses, who's on this journey, um, not just to say hello in Mazel Tov, he actually has some people with him he wants to present to Moses. Um, those people happen to be his wife and two sons. Moses, when he went off back to Egypt, started that journey with his wife and two sons and then uh, sent them back home. He went on the way by himself. And Yitro is there to bring his family, Moses's family, back to him. And I think that, that the reason this portion, one of the reasons might be named for Yitro, is because we oftentimes, especially if what we are doing is important and what could have been more important than the work that Moses was doing, we lose sight of other aspects of our life. We lose, often, we'll forget about our family. <laughs> we'll forget about those things that are at our heart and center of our being our family. Moses is headed back to Sinai with the Israelites after having conquered Egypt with a little assistance from God. And he doesn't think twice about going and finding his wife and kids and bringing them along with him. They're out of his mind. 
And Yitro says, Moses, slow down. What you're doing every day is vitally important. But don't forget those other needs that are central in your life. Don't forget your family. And as Jews, I would say that extends, right? It extends to our community, our Jewish community, our congregation. And it extends to our homeland, to Israel. And there is no organization that um, cares for the land uh, of Israel like JNF. Uh, they, since before the state was founded, they helped us to, to have a home, to come back, to return to the land. And, um, and the work they continue to do to make Israel a place that is uh, accessible to all. You, you're going to hear more about that from uh, JNF themselves. So I can let that be. But let's just take that moment to express a, a word of gratitude to Yitro, um, who reminds us that the work we do every day is important. But don't forget those vital commitments that we have to those things that are central in our life, our family, our community, and our our homeland, um, Israel. Uh, may we strive to follow in the footsteps of Yitro and Moses, uh, and um, may we strive to continue to build up the land of Israel. Thank you, JNF, for giving us this opportunity to share and learn together this morning, uh, 13 years, I think, and counting. I'm going to turn uh, the morning over to Jill Weininger, who's going to share a message with us now. Good morning to all of you. I miss my TBE family and all of our friends so much and I hope that all of you are doing well. I first became an investor in Jewish National Fund at the first Temple Bethel breakfast for JNF when Rick Krosnick introduced us to a project focused on water security in Israel. I still remember the feeling many years later when we visited Israel with fellow congregants in Rabbi Helbron and we saw the reservoirs and the purple pipes for the water reclamation and the sense of pride that both Bruce and I felt knowing that we had been a part of that project. Today, many years on, I'm proud to be the president of Jewish National Fund's Illinois Regional Board. And during my years on the board, I have learned just how much Jewish National Fund does to build and invest in the land of Israel. With projects that range from job training to agricultural investment to supporting people with special needs. But our work works two ways. We also support programs that are meant to benefit Jews who live outside of Israel. From our MUS high school program for students to set, spend a semester of their high school years in Israel, to college gap year programs, to our newest program called Fuel the Truth, which is designed to equip young professionals with the tools they need to be effective advocates for Israel and combat anti-Israel sentiment in a respectful way in conversations in their daily lives. It's not an exaggeration to say that the work of Jewish National Fund touches the lives of every single Israeli. Jewish National Fund is ensuring that Israel is a part of the next generation, both here in the US, in Illinois, and within our own Temple Bethel community. The video about to that we're gonna show you is just a hint of all that Jewish National Fund does. And I invite you to lean in, engage, and learn more and become a partner with Bruce and I as we all do our part to build a vibrant and strong Israel. It all begins with a vision, creating a bright and prosperous future for the land and people of Israel is Jewish National Fund's vision, the vision we build upon every day. To create change, you need a vision. A vision of lush and breathtaking forests where once was only rocky and brown land. A vision of transforming the Negev and the Galilee 
areas filled with pioneering spirit and determination, but faced with economic challenges. We're helping these areas reach their potential by creating jobs, housing, tourism, and quality of life opportunities, injecting a vitality that is transforming them into places people want to live. A vision for us to speak our values, leaving no one behind. vision of quenching the thirst of Israel's population and allowing the agricultural economy to thrive by bolstering Israel's water security with reservoirs, drip irrigation, and river rehabilitation. A vision that took Israel to recycling 85% of its water today. A vision that searches for solutions that will make a better tomorrow. From state-of-the-art greenhouses to flourishing pepper and flower farms, to high-tech labs that are working on medical breakthroughs. A vision of a continuum that engages at every age, from the time you're born, through adulthood, and beyond, ensuring that we are raising tomorrow's leaders today. A vision that understands that a nation must know its past to create a stronger future that the stories of our history are preserved to be retold for generations to come. Since 1901, Jewish National Fund has been guided by a vision of a bright, beautiful future for the land and people of Israel. A vision that Jewish National Fund delivers on year after year. Be a part of our vision. Join us. Thank you all for being here with us today to hear Rabbi Lippman. I want to share a few thoughts about why I think JNF is so important to our American Jewish community. For those who are unaware of this organization's history, JNF was founded at the Fifth World Jewish Congress in December of 1901. Its founding purpose was to raise money for the establishment of a Jewish homeland. By 1904, the organization was able to make its first purchase in a region of the Lower Galilee. JNF has historically not been just about land and of course trees, which currently is at 260 million trees and counting. JNF today is not only at this forefront of afforestation, but is investing in social programs and research. The list is long, but what I grew up knowing as the Tree in Blue Box collection charity is now contributing to Israeli society through many social programs. I want to share an abbreviated short list of some of these programs, which includes fortified indoor playgrounds for at-risk communities in Israel, heritage site preservation, programs for citizens with disabilities and special needs, February happens to be Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month. One such program that captures my empathy is what is called Special in Uniform. This program allows physically and mentally challenged Israeli citizens the opportunity to integrate into the IDF. The program helps them serve in the IDF and learn potential life skills to help contribute to Israeli society after their military service. The program has been so successful, special in uniform is being considered for the US Army. And by the way, any donations made this month in February and designated to our special needs and disabilities work will be matched by the Bookbinder Family Foundation and the Feinberg Foundation. JNF supports water conservation and water reclamation projects for agriculture. Israel is now able to capture 80% of its sewage water and reclaimed it for agriculture. We share this knowledge and technology throughout the world, but especially in vulnerable regions like Sub-Saharan Africa. There are projects on renewable energy, food security, and even a culinary institute in the Galilee. JNF is working to develop the communities outside the large population centers where 
working to develop communities in the Negev in the south and the Galilee in the north, away from the major population centers in Israel. We're engaged in Jewish and, Israel, and Israeli advocacy through high school and collegiate programs. Friends, we are hope, hopefully reaching a slow resolution to this unprecedented pandemic of our lifetimes. I support the Zionist dreams of a Jewish homeland through the work of JNF. As an American Jew, the Zionist dreams of 1901 are our realities, and it is my personal connection to Judaism. I would like to leave you with this thought from the past, a quote. Never was such a great Jewish community in such danger of gentle extinction as American Jewry today. If this great historic miracle had not taken place in our time, and the state of Israel had not risen, the great majority of Jews of the United States would have been left without any bond to Judaism. My friends, these words are of David Ben-Gurion from 1958, and they feel especially prescient to me today. Please consider working towards our collective future. Join me in contributing to JNF today. In a moment, you will receive an email and a text message from the Jewish National Fund providing you the opportunity to make a gift. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce a political and theological leader. He is a respected, educated rabbinic opinion as he holds rabbinic ordination from Nair Israel Rabbinical College and a master's in education from John Hopkins University. He's an active political leader being selected to the Knesset in January of 2013 as the first American born MK in 30 years. He is a widely published writer and media spokesperson on behalf of Israel as senior manager for community outreach for honest reporting, a columnist for the Jerusalem Post and Times of Israel, and as a political commentator for one I-24 News and ILTV. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a forerunner in Judaism and in contemporary political thought, Rabbi Dov Lipman. Rabbi Lipman will be answering questions near the end of the program. Please enter questions as they occur to you during his presentation using the chat function in Zoom and we will Virtually, try to get to I look forward to hopefully being in Chicago can. in person at some time soon. Everyone Thank you so much, Amy. Safe. I really and appreciate the and we'll introduction. This with God's it's help wonderful together. to be to with all, all of you, the whole uh, Temple Beat Beth virtually community for inviting me to join you. Thank you to Marlene and the entire JNF staff for being here. Uh, I learned something. I was watching the trivia before and uh, 1901. That's pretty remarkable when you think about what Israel was then and where Israel is now and the role that JNF has played in making that happen. So thank you to all of you for supporting this wonderful organization that is doing so much uh, for Israel. And I hope that you can do as much as possible to enable them to continue doing so. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I never would have imagined that I'd be sitting and talking to you from Israel, certainly not as a member, former member of Knesset. My wife and I made the decision to move to Israel in the beginning of 2004. And I made a phone call when we made that decision. And that phone call was to my grandmother. Now, all of you who have been blessed to have grandmothers, uh, certainly grandmothers that you're close to, you can imagine the fear, that's the only word that I can use, that I had in making this phone call. My grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. Here she was in the golden years of her life, enjoying her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, then thank God her great-great-grandchildren. And she lived in New York. We were in Maryland. We saw her all the time. And now I have to tell her that we're picking up and moving thousands of miles away. I was so afraid to make this phone call, but I finally had the courage. I picked up the phone and I said, Bubby, I have some news for you. God willing this summer, Dina, myself, the children, we are moving to Israel, we're making Aliyah. And I was prepared for what I somewhat jokingly call the wrath of Bubby. My grandmother did not have much political correctness. She said what was on her mind. And I was prepared for her to be upset that we were moving away. There was a pause after I shared the news. And then my grandmother said, Baruch ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Shehechiyanu Vekimanu Vihigiyanu Lazman Hazeh. She said a blessing, giving thanks to God for bringing the, her to this day. A Holocaust survivor who's now going to see her grandchildren and great-grandchildren move to the Jewish 
state of Israel. And that blessing from my grandmother rings in my ears all the times and helps me remember the magnitude of what is happening in this story in Israel. I'll fast forward to July 2004. We drove up the New Jersey Turnpike. We went to JFK Airport. We were on one of the first flights of Nefesh Benefesh. I want to emphasize a JNF partner organization. We could not have made Aliyah. I would not be sitting here in Israel were it not for the help of Nefesh Benefesh with JNF. They chartered a flight. Every single passenger was moving to Israel. Just imagine for a moment the excitement and the enthusiasm mixed with, with anxieties and fears. And we're getting our children settled on the plane. And the pilot begins to speak to us. Like before every flight you go on, he has an Israeli accent, presumably a former Israeli Air Force pilot. And he went through the whole routine about the flight. And then he said, everybody sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. I'm here to take you home. I froze in place. The magnitude of what was happening all of a sudden hit me again. First, my grandmother's blessing, and then this pilot. 2,000 years ago, our ancestors were ruthlessly exiled from this land, and we went around from country to country, continent to continent, except for our experience in America. We were thrown out or we ran away. And here my wife and I and our family were blessed to be the links in the chain to fulfill the prayers of our ancestors of next year in Jerusalem. And here we were being the links in the chain to bring us back home. We moved to such an incredible country. At the time it was 56 years old. Uh, everything we could have wanted handed to us on a silver platter, education for our children, health services, transportation. But I learned in the city of Beit Shemesh where we live that there's one thing we haven't figured out how to get right. And that is, how do you take Jews from 2,000 years of experiences all around the world, different national experiences, religious experiences, cultural experiences, put them in this small little area we call Israel, and get along with each other? We haven't figured that out. And for me, growing up in America, where in the streets of Silver Spring, I played ball with my Christian and Muslim, uh, Asian American, African American, Hispanic American friends. These issues of different cultures and different backgrounds was, didn't mean anything to me. It, we, all those barriers were broken down. It was very hard for me to see the tensions in Israel. That got me involved in community activism in Israel. And one thing led to another, and I was asked to be on a candidate list for Knesset in January 2013 for the Yesh Atid party. Uh, it was a great honor for me as someone who was just in Israel less than a decade, and now being asked to run for the Knesset. Uh, I was number 17 on the list. The way it works here is that every party makes a list of 120 names. There are 120 seats in the Knesset. As every Knesset, very as every party, very optimistically plans their complete and total takeover of the Knesset. Uh, no one has ever gotten even close to a majority. I was number seventeen. The party was pulling at about five or six seats at the time. It wasn't realistic at all for me to get in, but I was there to campaign. There was one person in the world who believed that I would get into the Knesset, and that was my mother, who, like a good Jewish mother, made Aliyah move to Israel so she could vote for me in the election. How do you like that one? So she was my support system. And there we were on election night. They announced the results out of nowhere. Our party won 19 seats. I found myself elected to Knesset overnight. I, I remember being so thankful to God for this opportunity, not just to be complaining all the time about what's happening in the country, but to try to roll up my sleeves and try to make a difference. I found out that night that I was the first American born member of Knesset in 30 years. I found out during the two weeks between the election and the inauguration that I had to renounce my American citizenship, not something that was easy to do at all. It's the Israeli law that requires it. And with tears in my eyes, I stood in the American embassy and raised my right hand and said that I hereby renounce my citizenship in the United States of America, a country that gave my family so much and gave me so much, but I had to do this for the opportunity to serve in the Knesset. My number one fear serving in the Knesset was the issue of Hebrew. Uh, I am the proud graduate of 12 years of a Jewish day school education in North America. Somehow Hebrew was lost along the way. By the way, that should become a, a more of a focus. And I had to do something about this. The Knesset gives every single member a budget to learn a second language. Most use it for uh, English, some use it for Arabic, some use it for Russian, and I made history. I was the first sitting member of Knesset to use the budget for Hebrew. And every Tuesday, every day, almost every day, my tutor Nadav would come in. He worked with me so hard. And I wanna tell all of you, 
None of you should ever think that Hebrew is the obstacle stopping you from living in Israel, spending extended time in Israel. You can do it. I, I'm not a genius of any kind. I work very hard. That I will tell you, and my Hebrew is still not the level of my English, but I can communicate without a fear of any, making any kind of a mistake. I had a few portfolios that I had to work on in the Knesset. Uh, one of them was the environment. Talk about working in partnership with JNF and trying to protect the beauty of this incredible country, which JNF has had a major impact on. So I usually lose half the audience when I tell this story, so I apologize in advance. But I grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, where over a decade ago, they passed legislation for plastic bags, charging people to use plastic bags. Everyone screamed and yelled, how can you do this? And now no one even thinks about using a plastic bag. And I would drive around Israel, this beautiful country of ours, and everywhere I would see these plastic bags, which don't decompose at all. All they do is give off toxins into the air. So I came to the Knesset with the idea of bringing that law. People looked at me like, I'm crazy. One member of Knesset says it the way members of Knesset said it. They said, Dove, you're such a smart guy. What a stupid law. But I persevered and I stayed with it. And eventually a government minister took it as a law. The law passed and went into effect in January 1st, 2017. The first year we anticipated a 40% reduction in plastic bag use. Would you imagine 70% reduction in the first year as we try to help beautify our country? That's an example of a piece of legislation that I was able to push through and sponsor and push through as someone who came from the United States. Uh, I worked on issues of religion and state. For me, it's natural. Jews of all backgrounds can love one another, get along with one another, accept one another, and try to make real progress on those issues in the Knesset. Because in Israel, it's not as assumed. And it's a difficult issue in terms of religious pluralism. A number one focus, though, was the issue of the integration of the ultra-Orthodox into Israeli society. I went to a Haredi ultra-Orthodox yeshiva in America, in Baltimore, where most of us went to university at night. We earned college degrees. Why can't they would be the case here and let the ultra-Orthodox continue to be fervently Orthodox, but be part of Israeli society. And I was able to get government funding and private funding and start all kinds of programs. And thank God, looking back now, oh, more than seven years later, we've been able to help 80,000 young men, uh, ultra-Orthodox men, get training, get jobs. I'm emphasizing men because the women were already getting an education and going to work. And now we're trying to help catch up with the men army programs, general studies in high schools, and that's a, a project I continue to be involved with uh, up until today. Out of nowhere, I was thrown into the issue of diplomacy. I had no background in foreign policy at all, and certainly didn't know what I was doing when I first started. But I think the second week I was in the Knesset, we got a call that there were 20 members of the French parliament in the building, and they asked me to go to speak to them. And I said, I don't have any background for this. Why are you asking me? They basically said, you're one of a handful of members of Knesset who speaks English, go meet with them. I go into this room and I just started talking about all the wonderful things that are happening in Israel. Um, medical advances, technology, there had just been a natural disaster in a third world country. Israel was the only country with a field hospital on the ground. There are all the things we're so proud of about Israel. I was no more than five minutes into the presentation and a member of the French parliament interrupted me mid-sentence, I'll never forget. He said, excuse me, sir. We don't want to hear about all of this. We are here to tell you to stop building settlements. Because Israel is building settlements, the Middle East is in flames. And because of Israel, radical Islam has spread all around the world and has even reached France. Wow, that's a pretty heavy indictment for our tiny little country. I'm willing to have a conversation with anyone about Israel's settlement policies, and you can be critical of Israel's policies. There's a democratically elected government that makes decisions, but we can be critical of each other's country's policies. But to suggest that because Israel's building settlements, that's why the Middle East is in flames, Israel is the reason why radical Islam is spreading all around the world, that's not something I'm willing to accept. And I used the platform as a member of Knesset and still do till today to travel around the world to parliaments and college campuses and make the case for Israel. When I make the case for Israel, I don't say you can't criticize Israel. I don't say that Israel doesn't make mistakes. But there's a line that you cross from legitimate criticism to outright anti-Israel bias and saying that Israel essentially does not have a right to even exist as a Jewish state, and that is what we fight against. Don't say that Israel's over here and human rights and justice are over here. No, they're one and the same, and you're being misled when you think otherwise. We are in a very complex 
complicated co conflict with the Palestinians. There is no simple solution that anyone can really suggest on the table. And we have to find a way to manage it and work through it along the way, certainly trying to make sure that everyone living within these borders is taken care of as best as possible. So that was another thing which I did as a member of Knesset. But out of all the experiences that I had, what really sticks out in my mind is the summer of 2014. When we went to war in Gaza, after the three boys were kidnapped, their bodies were found, Hamas was involved, we arrested members of Hamas, Hamas starts firing missiles, and we have no choice but to go into Gaza. And by the way, JNF is very involved in helping the children who live in the area around Gaza to make sure that they're safe and they have a fun place to go, so to speak, when they have missiles coming, they even decorate, I was part of it, painting and decorating the bomb shelters. But we were at war in Gaza, and for me it was very difficult as a former American, never exposed to war like this, but I just want to tell you one moment that happened which inspires me. There was a young American lone soldier named Max Steinberg who was killed in Gaza and his parents came to Israel for his burial and we expected a small, they didn't know anyone in Israel, no family, no friends, a small graveside ceremony. We get to Mount Herzl in Jerusalem on a summer afternoon and there are 35,000 Israelis there who came to give respect to Max. And his mother said to me, Dove, I feel like I'm getting a hug. Who are these people? These are the people of Israel coming out to shower us with love. I feel them picking me up with this hug. It was an amazing moment where 35,000 Israelis never heard about Max, didn't know about Max, came to give respect. We truly are one people. We allow so much to divide us, but despite the ocean that's between us, we really are one people. And we truly can be with each other, be there for each other in times of need, and hopefully not just in the times of need. I'm gonna end with one point, and then we'll take your questions. People often ask me, what do I think about Israel's future? You're in the Knesset, you're aware of the security issues, the inner tensions within Israel. What's gonna happen with Israel? I can look at every single one of you through this camera and tell you, I am nothing but optimistic about Israel's future. Yes, there are challenges. And sadly, there are sacrifices along the way. But we have to zoom out for a moment and remember what is happening here a Jewish state. What would our great, great, great grandparents have given up the opportunity to breathe the air of Jerusalem for five minutes? And here it is, right here in front of us, prophecies coming true from the Bible of the ingathering, the exiles. And yes, the reflourishing of Israel, it's described openly in the prophets. And JNF has played such an important role in that. For me, the moment that captures how great this time is, is my grandmother, who sadly passed away last year. But she gave me that blessing when we first made Aliyah. She found the strength to come to Israel when I was in the Knesset. And she was sitting in my Knesset office 70 years after her liberation from Auschwitz. And she says to me, Dove, this doesn't make any sense. A Jewish state, Israel, Jewish capital, Jerusalem, Jewish parliament, the Knesset, my grandson as a member, this doesn't make any sense. A woman who survived Auschwitz, Birkenau, and so most of her family killed, they're exterminated there. And she's right. We are blessed to live in the most incredible of times. And the challenge for all of us is to stand up and be counted and be part of this. If we're blessed to live in these incredible times, then we have to be incredible. And I know that all of you are doing that with your support for JNF. And I certainly call on you to do even more as they do so much work to help Israel continue on its positive path. And with God's help, all of us working together, each one of us in our own way, we will help Israel get to its rightful place as a light unto the nations, fulfilling our national destiny and fulfilling ultimately the destiny that we have to light up the world and change the world for the better. So I thank all of you again, and I'm more than ecstatic to be with you today. And now I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Rabbi Lippman, for a terrific presentation and sharing your experiences. Um, we do have we do have some questions. The first one is should not be a surprise, and that is, can you please comment on the upcoming fourth elections and what it means to the Israeli people? Don't you all see what a celebration of Israeli democracy this is? We just want to have elections four times in two years to show that we're a democratic country in the Middle East. Um, putting that aside, it's a challenging time in Israel. We have not been able to find stability in government. For the fourth time, the elections are very much not about issues, but about yes, Netanyahu or no Netanyahu. And I'm not going to weigh in on the political side with you, uh, but it is a difficult time. And if you ask me, uh, I think that the you know, if I had to bet on it, I think we're heading to a fifth election based on what I see the polls are, 
right now. We've just not been able to find a constellation for any kind of a solid government. It's interesting. Israel has definitely shifted to the right over the last few decades as we've made numerous attempts to reach an agreement with the Palestinians and they've failed or even led to worse situations for us on a security front. But a lot of those right-wing parties don't necessarily uh, agree with having Netanyahu as prime minister. So uh, we'll have to have another event together, maybe post-election, I could just dissect it for all of you and explain what's going on. We did have 39 parties register uh, this past Thursday for the election, but not that many of them will get in. You have to have 3.25% of the vote to get into the Knesset, about four seats. But as of now, uh, if I had to rank it, the number one option is the fifth election. The number two option is Netanyahu gets a narrow right-wing religious government. And the third very, very far uh, distant option is that all the parties that don't want Netanyahu as prime minister will find a way to come together, but I don't see that happening. That's the situation here right now. Thank you. Other than anti-Israel bias, is there a reason why countries have refused Israel aid for things like water reclamation? Very difficult. I, I, I'm not a person, again, having grown up in America, who likes to jump to the anti-Semitic card. I don't go there very quickly. But I will tell you, having sat in parliament around the world, presenting facts, not different narratives, just facts on the ground, it's very, very difficult uh, to come to a conclusion at times that there's anti-Semitism that's masking itself as an anti-Israel sentiment. I mean, you look at everything that Israel's doing for the world and, and contributing. I mean, JNF certainly plays a role in that in terms of the water technology and environmental issues. It's very hard to understand why uh, there wouldn't be partnerships developing. But I will say, we're starting to see a breakthrough. I saw that there was a question about the Abraham Accords. Just my eye caught it in the chat. There are positive things that are happening on the diplomatic front as countries are starting to realize, let's put aside all the old biases and let's benefit from a relationship with this incredible country that can give us so much. My son in a month from now, uh, hopefully did, we have to deal with Corona issues, but hopefully is traveling to Dubai as a coach of the Israel National Little League team. By the way, JNF has a plan for helping build baseball fields uh, in Israel for our children to be able to experience a piece of America uh, here in Israel. They're going to Dubai to the United Arab Emirates, an Israeli team of young kids to play Little League Baseball. Uh, just amazing things that are happening. So hopefully uh, that'll begin to spread to other countries as well. But if the bottom line, why do countries not act together with Israel? After sitting with them and explaining to them that there's definitely some element of some anti-Semitism mixed in because otherwise I really have no rational explanation for it. Thank you. And following up on the Abraham Accords, what is the view of kind of the Israelis on the street on the Abraham Accords? Israelis are, are exhilarated by it. Even those who are on the anti-Netanyahu camp, they do, they do praise him for that. They definitely see that there have been positive uh, things that he's done and that he's accomplished. And that's really wonderful to see. Israelis flocked to Dubai <laughs> I think they flocked too quickly to Dubai because we actually believe that a lot of the uh, corona and possible mutations came from there. Uh, but Israelis are thrilled about it, excited about it, and, and can't get enough of the idea of our visiting Arab countries and Arab uh, residents visiting Israel. So a question about your Knesset run. When you first decided to run for Knesset, what made you decide to run with a secular party versus one of the religious parties? It's a really great question, and it's an issue that I took a lot of flack for as a member of the religious community. Yair Lapid uh, is very secular in his background, and the party was viewed as being almost anti-religious in nature. It was untrue, but yet it was a risk that I was taking. I believe that there's no reason for religious parties or secular parties. That's not what politics is for. And I actually saw it as an opportunity to work together and break down barriers. And tremendous things were accomplished during that term because we were religious and secular uh, working together. And I hope that it's a model that all Israelis will see as we try to break down these barriers and, and try to create unity and harmony in Israel. We can disagree with each other. We can live different lifestyles. But when it's all said and done, we're just one family. And we really have to uh, understand that loving one another is not just a cliche, but it has to show itself in practice. And that's what I was trying to do by being part of a party that was secular in nature, but also brought some religious members on board. Thank you. And for, for our last question, several people have asked is, what are your thoughts about how Israel has handled the COVID situation? And what can we outside of Israel learn 
learn from Israel's experiences? There's no doubt that Israel has struggled as every country around the world has struggled in terms of dealing with it. We thought we got through the first wave. Wow, that first wave, Israelis were in lockdown. Everyone kept to it. Uh, I'm thinking about this amazing, amazing moment that happened last Passover where there was a call that at 8.30 at night on the Seder night, everyone should go out to their porches and sing Manishtana together. And we did. And all these people who are alone for the Seder were able to be together with others. It was such a beautiful moment and everyone really stuck to it. But people were hit very hard economically. We are, we're talking about about a million people in Israel that are unemployed, uh, people all over that don't have jobs, don't have income. Israel has tried very hard to keep up with that and give them the grants and the other financial uh, help that they need. But then when it came to the second wave and now the third wave, people are not being as strict anymore, especially now that we have the vaccines. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you and I've been vaccinated twice. Uh, my wife is fully vaccinated and there's a certain feeling of relief, but then you hear at the same time that maybe it doesn't cover the mutations and there's a lot of red hesitance about how much do we start opening up. So I, I think that there's been way too much politics involved. We've been in election cycles through all of this and I fear, I fear that that has impacted decision-making. So the vaccinations are great and Israel gets an A plus for that. Uh, in terms of everything else, it's been a struggle like it's been all around the world. And all we can do for each other at this point, to be honest with you, uh, is pray for each other and send strength to one another because uh, you know, hopefully people will keep to the rules as best as possible and hopefully we'll get out of this as soon as possible because it certainly has been a very, very challenging time uh, in Israel. I can speak to you as the father of a daughter who got married in a Corona wedding. Uh, it was not the wedding that my daughter dreamed of, uh, but her marriage is the marriage that she dreamed of and that's what makes us the most happy. Thank you very much, Rabbi Lippman, for answering all those questions and for your time this morning. Now I'm going to turn it over to Lonnie Glickson. Thank you again for sharing this event with, with us. I would again like to thank our co-chairs, Amy and Rich Noren, my husband Scott, and the entire committee, as well as Rabbi Lippman. And we encourage you to continue your important support for JNF.